Hi, everyone. Robin here. By now, you know the drill. Because this season of The City is about strip clubs, it's not suitable for everyone, especially kids. And this episode has explicit language, including explicit conversations about sex. Okay, here's the show. Previously on The City. We all know that this is a theater. You know, the the name of the game is to step up to the line and not go over it. I think that's true. You know, it's all in the tape. Like, maybe's not yes. And so I was really confident. I appreciate old Reno, but I also am going to fight to the nail for this town to move into the future. You run the business quietly, out of town. You're not by a school or a church or any of the public facilities. And you stay below the sagebrush. So they purposely picked Sunday night, Monday morning, knowing the club was closed, to go down in the basement. For We have that bug down there that we saw, right? Did you show her the bug? If there's anything we've learned about Reno this season, it's that this city is not afraid to reinvent itself. When the silver mines went bust, Reno didn't sit around and wait for a new mine to open. It became the one place in the country you could get a quick divorce. Then, one of the few places in the country you could legally gamble. And more recently, after the foreclosure crisis hit, Reno started to shed its tired casino town image and become a landing spot for some of Silicon Valley's biggest names. Reno has this amazing ability to shapeshift, to cut its losses and move on to the next big thing. But what does it lose in the process? In our season two finale, reporter Anjanette Damon and producer Phil Corbett take a trip back to the beginning of the city itself. Phil and I are wandering through a place few Renoites have been. The quiet, dark tunnels that run underneath the city's oldest commercial building, the Reno Mercantile. So we're uh, in the tunnel now? Or we're, we're in the under- tunnel, yeah. We're actually out under the sidewalk right now. Our tour guide is Jeremy McGilvray, a general contractor who's working on the building above us. The air is still and musty. We can see only as far as our flashlights shine. Dust particles float through the light. Phil and I carefully pick our way around fallen bricks and wooden beams. I mean, and you can see, I mean, it was it was really interesting with these barrel arch brick ceilings and everything else. But if you look at the columns, there's just oh whoa, there there's nothing left of the columns. They're yeah, what are they're those? rotted out. That... That's steel. Okay. That's steel pipes. But you can see how it's actually crushed and rotted out and just collapsing. Wow. So. The once grand two-story brick building above us dates back to 1872, when Reno was still a mining town. The ground floor was a general store, and Jeremy says that merchants kept everything from ice to booze to dynamite in these tunnels below the street. The general store was there for more than a century, closing in the 1970s. In true Reno fashion, it then became a pawn shop, then storage for the casino next door. We come to what looks like the end of the tunnel, or so we think. That's the, like, a cement barrier that just ends the tunnel right there. Uh, it actually, it's a giant cement pier that's here. You can actually get around it, back behind it. Uh-huh. There's, like, a little vault room. Oh, um, interesting. That locks from the inside. Whoa. What? <laughs> oh, yeah. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're, wow. wel- you're welcome to... Yeah. To slide around there and take a look at it oh, if you want. Phil and I squeeze through the small gap between that giant cement pier and the wall of the building to find this tiny room built nearly 150 years ago. It's maybe four feet wide by eight feet long. It has the same barrel arch brick ceiling as the tunnel outside. And Jeremy's right. The rusty metal door locks from the inside. Oh, wow. That's crazy. We stand in this small room, laying our hands on the cold brick walls, exploring the ceiling with our flashlight. Can you describe the smell? It's... 
I mean, there's been no ventilation down here, I imagine, for ever, really. It's just still cold, damp. And that's really rare in Reno. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It smells like some old place on the East Coast or Europe. It's like Phil and I are being let in on one of Reno's oldest secrets. These tunnels existed before almost anything else in Reno. The mercantile building is in the heart of downtown, just a block away from Reno's iconic Biggest Little City Arch, and less than a mile away from the Wild Orchid. Both of us have walked right over this silent vault so many times, never knowing what was just beneath our feet. In a city that has reinvented itself over and over, letting go of bits of its past at every turn, it's so rare to experience something from Reno's earliest days. And it's not something that Phil or I or anyone else will be able to experience again. Jeremy McGilvray is here because he's overseeing the building's demolition. By the time you hear this, the Reno Mercantile Building and these tunnels will be gone. Upstairs, construction crews are already busy dismantling the building, piece by piece. So right now what you can hear is they're uh, breaking the uh, bricks apart so they can remove the bricks one at a time. The mercantile building has been left empty for too long, more than three decades. The support structures are collapsing. The masonry is crumbling. There's no way to save it. We are um, pulling, essentially deconstructing the building so we can save as much of the materials as possible to reuse in the new building that we're putting up. They're tearing down both the mercantile building and the old Reno Casino next door. Yeah, it's literally called the Old Reno Casino. The neighboring Whitney Peak Hotel owns the building and it's looking to expand. The new building, built with pieces of the old building, will be a 100-room extended-stay hotel. More rooms for the Tesla and Panasonic executives staying in Reno while they oversee work at the Gigafactory. Um, I have been heavily involved in changes that we've seen in downtown Reno um, over the last 10 years. and. Uh, I think they're good. I think it's, as much as everybody's sad to see it go, it's something good for downtown. It's good for the city. From the beginning of this story, I've tried to sort out whether that's really true, whether all these changes we've seen in Reno are actually good for the city. That question feels more urgent to me now than ever. Because on this street corner, in the heart of downtown, old Reno is being taken apart, brick by brick, to make way for new Reno. I'm Ann Jeanette Damon. From USA Today and the Reno Gazette Journal, this is The City. All right, let's take stock of where things stand. There's one last showdown looming between the strip clubs and the Reno City Council. After four years, the council has finally scheduled a vote on whether to beef up regulations or kick them out of downtown altogether. There's a lot riding on this vote. Depending on the outcome, Velma Scholes and her neighbors at the Ponderosa might be out of a home. Stephanie, the dancer, might be out of a job, and Kami Kashmiri could see his strip club empire gutted. We'll get to that vote in a few minutes. But first, remember that little black box that Kami found plugged into the basement of the Wild Orchid? Did the cops really plant a bug in his strip club? It's been nagging at Anjanette. To be honest, it sounds crazy that two cops would come to the Ponderosa Hotel in the middle of the night ask to be led into the basement, and then surreptitiously plant a bug. But in the past year, I've seen the city do a lot of things that have surprised me. Cammy and his lawyer had pretty much dropped the whole bug thing, but I still wanted to figure it out. Hi. 
Hi. Hey, Mark, it's Ann Jeanette. What did I do this time? I don't think <laughs> anything yet, but I have oh, yet to do more reporting. <laughs> <laughs> Mark Thurman's had this little black box in his filing cabinet since Cammie found it. I ask him if anything's happened with it. Nope. No. Just sitting there. I don't even know what it is. I ask him if I could take a look at it, and he says yes. Even offers to drive it to my office at the newspaper. He hands it over, and Phil and I turn to the internet to do as much sleuthing as we can. Netgear. 2300. Wi-Fi router. Little WNR 2000 V5. Well, looks like it's a $35 router at Target. Cami said it was broadcasting a Wi Fi signal that no one at the club recognized. The signal name was Baloo, like the bear in the Jungle Book. Next, I do something that most tech security experts would advise against I plug the device into my computer. Phil and I wait a moment, and then, <gasps> Baloo, there it is, that's oh, it. That is it. It's got a lock on it, so there's a password. I mean, we should try a password for sure. Well, that's what it says it is. Sadly, the password was not password. All right. I think we need to find an expert. <laughs> <laughs> So I retired as a de detective sergeant with the city of Reno Police Department where I was running the financial crimes and the computer crimes unit. That's retired Reno Police Sergeant Todd Shipley. I met Shipley nearly 20 years ago when I was a cops reporter. Today, Shipley is a cybersecurity expert. He trains law enforcement officers on how to investigate crimes on the dark net. I've told him very little about the device from the Wild Orchid. I want to capture his initial impression without biasing him. He was very nice to play along and stops by the newsroom. All right, ready? Yeah. Okay. I pull out the box and he recognizes it instantly. Okay, so it's just a little Netgear router, which is ob the obvious part of it, and it was plugged into their network. Shipley says he sees this a lot someone using a cheap router to bypass network security measures to poach some Wi-Fi. But could a little router like this be used to spy on someone, to intercept data, for instance? Shipley says sure, but not easily. That would take some sophisticated setup. At this point, I decide to just give him the full story. I tell him about the cops walking through the Wild Orchid basement in the middle of the night and Cammie finding the router. And they're like, what is this? Did the police put this here? And are the police spying on us? <laughs> you want to, you, you want me to respond to that, don't you? If you want to. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. That's a pretty big stretch. Because personally, this is not the way I would, that's not the way I would attack it. Shipley says it would be too risky for police to install a bug like that, even if they did have a proper warrant. And then there's the actual data collection. This wouldn't be just listening to a phone call. The police would need the expertise to intercept and then interpret the data they were collecting. Shipley doesn't believe the Reno police have the resources to do that kind of thing. No, I, I can almost 100% guarantee that that's not what's going. You know, I, because it's too complicated on their end to do this. The most likely scenario, someone's just trying to steal Wi-Fi. Who it's does just, their actual IT stuff? Just a guy that lives in the Ponderosa. Oh. <laughs> so they don't really have anybody that does IT. No. So I mean, he the, does the, IT, the, but... Like, so the most likely person that did this... Is that guy. Well, that would be the first place I'd go, you know. I did ask, and that IT guy, the guy living at the Ponderosa and offering his skills for a break on his rent, he didn't want to talk to me. So I still have no idea where this router came from, but it's probably not a bug. And I know this whole thing with the little black box feels a little silly now, but this is where we are with the city of Reno. In 2007, police raided Cammie's club mere hours after he filed a lawsuit against them. 
Ten years later, the city attorney secretly hires a private investigator to spy on him. For a decade, the city let slide its oversight duties, doing just cursory level inspections. Then suddenly, when there's a political move afoot, it deploys its entire arsenal of inspectors against the strip clubs. I can understand why Cami might be suspicious. While Anjanette was busy investigating the bug, Mark and Cami had their hands full, preparing for their long-awaited showdown with the Reno City Council. That showdown after the break. I love this time of year, the cold weather, the warm drinks, and I genuinely love shopping for holiday gifts, which is why I'm so excited about VeraShop, the new shopping destination where you can find all the gifts you need in one place. VeraShop is a new online shopping site with the brands you need for every moment in your life, from women's and men's fashion to home decor, beauty, and wellness. And they get your purchases to you fast with free one-day shipping and free returns, with no membership fee and no minimum purchase required. The expert retail team at Verashop hand-selects and sources every single item from the brands, so there's no chance of counterfeits or fake goods. They even give you the option to pay over time, and their customer care representatives are available 24-7 by phone, text, or email. Shop with Verashop for the fastest free shipping out there. As a listener of the city, you can take 15% off your first purchase to try it out. Just go to verashop.com slash the city and enter code the city at checkout. That's V-E-R-I-S-H-O-P dot com slash the city, code the city for 15% off your first purchase. Exclusions apply. This fight has created a lot of uncertainty for people who live and work in Reno. And at times, it seemed as if the city's very identity has hung in the balance. But progress has not waited for this fight to be over. Since we first started reporting this season, Reno has added more than 15,000 new jobs. Financial tech and blockchain companies have opened new headquarters. And developers have erected new condos all over Midtown. But now the Reno City Council is finally poised to make a decision about the fate of the strip clubs. A decision that will have ripple effects far beyond the wild orchid. Here's Anjanette. It's April 24th, 2019, and I'm standing in the busy lobby outside the city council chambers with Mark and Cami. Today we will finally find out just what the council is going to do with the strip clubs. What do you think is going to happen in there today? You know, the way these meetings go, I, <laughs> I couldn't tell you. Honestly, I have no idea. We come here, we fight, and we'll fight, and we'll fight. I can just tell you this. We will fight as long as we will fight. Yes, he used the word fight five times. I ask him, are you scared? Uh, you know what? I'm not scared. Of, no, no, I'm not scared. This has only made me stronger, actually. This whole experience has made me stronger, tougher, and wiser. We are going to be a political force in this city. All this has done is woke us up to where we will be, what is it, the Koch brothers of po- politics? The Koch brothers is how you pronounce it? You know what? I was the best at everything I've done in my life, and I'm going to be the best at this. Politics, we will be the number one group, whatever you call it, whatever they call it in politics, we will be the top dog. Back in our first episode, Cami vowed to take revenge on the powers aligned against him. I think this is what he meant. He desperately wants to be a force in this city to preserve in the new Reno the status and power he achieved in the old Reno. First as a sports star, and then the city's strip club kingpin. Now he's trying his hand at politics. After Reno's elected city attorney, Carl Hall, hired private eyes to spy on Cammy's clubs, Cammy backed Hall's opponent. During the campaign, Cammy used the digital sign at the Wild Orchid to describe Hall as creepy, 
worthless, wasteful, sneaky, sexist, incompetent, and inept. At the time, Carl Hall shrugged it off with a joke, saying at least the sign wasn't showing scantily clad women anymore. Cammie's gambit with the sign didn't work. Hall won re-election. But Cammie did have more success helping to get a new city councilwoman elected, one who supported his cause. With Cammie's backing, she replaced a councilman who was adamant about kicking strip clubs out of downtown. In essence, Cammie helped flip one vote on the council. Would it be enough? I walk into council chambers and the crowd is thin. Unlike previous council meetings, the room isn't full of angry strippers and Ponderosa residents. And people like Mike Kazmierski and Abby Whitaker are nowhere to be seen. I suspect that the key people involved already know how this is going to play out. And so they've told their armies to stay home. But I have no idea how this vote is going to go down. All right. Reno Mayor Hillary Sheevy takes up the strip club agenda item. Let the record reflect that the city council is opening the public hearing at this time. At least one club opponent isn't giving up. Melissa Holland, the anti-sex trafficking activist. She's rallied some of her volunteers to come with her to council. Three small children stand against a back wall holding signs that say, value, honor, respect, and please keep adult businesses out of my view. She gives it one last shot trying to convince the council to move the clubs. There are illegal activities taking place within them. They are not self-regulating to make any of it better. They are not entitled to remain where they are, and they are not above the law. And then, for the first time since all of this started, Kami Kashmiri gets up from his seat and moves towards the podium to publicly address the Reno City Council. Over the past year, I have sat with Cammie at his corner table at the Wild Orchid and in his office at the Ponderosa and listened to him sustain rants longer than 30 minutes about how unfairly the council has treated him. Now, he is face to face with the people he says have persecuted him, bullied him. I have no idea what to expect. It wasn't this. Hello, Cammie Kishmary, uh, proprietor of the uh, Wild Orchid and Spice House and Fantasy Girls. i just like to say we did submit a business uh, impact statement that uh, $25 million loss for the dancers and uh, um, um, for the dancers. Uh, sorry, I'm not used to being up here. Um, but we did supply a business impact statement. So I just want to say, where where is that? And did you guys see that? Thank you. That's it. That's the whole thing. Where the heck did all his bravado go? He sounded so nervous, almost timid. But Cammie's decision to leave his bluster at the club and bring a business impact statement instead shows he's kind of on the ball. He commissioned an accountant to calculate what kind of economic loss the city would suffer if the strip clubs were run out of downtown. The report, complete with specific line item cost estimates, concluded it would cost the city $25 million in lost economic activity. Things like earnings for the dancers, profit for the clubs, tax revenue for local government. This is actually key. The city wrote its own business impact statement too, a kind of broad survey of public opinion about the clubs that, unlike Cammie's statement, included no spreadsheets, no cost estimates, no revenue figures at all. And now, Carl Hall's staff tells the city council that their report proves there would be, quote, no significant economic burden on the clubs. But at least one councilman isn't buying it. So where in the record am I to point to uh, when I am subsequently on the stand in a lawsuit Uh, that comes inevitably because they won't like the outcome if that's what we do. That's Councilman Devin Reese. Reese is a local lawyer who was appointed to fill a vacancy just two months before this meeting. He knows that if the city moves forward with the proposal to kick out the clubs, it is likely going to face a bevy of expensive lawsuits. And he fears going into court with such an empty report. Where is the record that makes that case for the no economic impact or no burden on the businesses? Where is that? 
Since Reese's appointment, Cammy and Mark have gone to work trying to win him over to their side, giving him a tour of the clubs and arguing the council is on a vendetta and attacking civil rights. From the sound of it, Cammy may have made some headway with Reese, who starts arguing with the deputy city attorney, calling her out on the city's mediocre report. Are there spreadsheets and numbers that tell me what the cost is? If if that if that was nece- if that was necessitated to be conducted, then that potentially could be done. Is my understanding? Well, I'm asking you, what is there at all in its entirety? Just point me to one thing which I would hang my hat on that would be a part of that impact. The attorney couldn't do it. The city's report had none of that detail, no evidence to back up a claim that these new laws would do no financial harm to the clubs. This is not an impressive showing by Carl Hall's office. Hall's staff has had four years to work on this. Four years! They've hired a private eye. They've been gathering evidence to show that the clubs are bad actors. They're prosecuting Stephanie for responding maybe to an undercover cop. There's barely a reference to any of this in the public testimony. It looks like the city's case against the strip clubs is falling apart. Someone proposes delaying the vote to give the city attorney's office more time to get its act together. But Councilwoman Neoma Jardin isn't willing to do that. I don't want to leave here today without giving clear direction. It's been four years. We need to move past this. And, and whatever that past this is needs to happen today, in my opinion. Jardin is the one who started all of this back in 2015 with the request for a temporary ban on new strip clubs downtown. But by this point, she's fed up. This was not in any way, shape, or form in my intent of doing that to drive any business out of business or out of its location. So somehow in the last four years, it went from uh, a pause so we could have detailed discussions about what we want to see, where on the go forward, It morphed into a private investigation, not initiated by this body, um, that we didn't bring forward. This council did not ask for it. We did not initiate it. So I just want to get four years ago where we started from and where we appear to be today. For those that are wondering how we got to this very complex, somewhat convoluted spot. Um, So I just, I felt... Madam Mayor, that I needed to get that on the record. Jardin doesn't want to kick existing strip clubs out of downtown. To her, using government power to shut down private businesses is a really big deal in any context. But she doesn't want to leave the clubs alone either. Remember, it's not just relocating the clubs that's on the agenda here. The council also must decide whether to put more restrictions on how they operate. And that's just what it does. One after another, the council votes to ban dancers younger than 21. All those in favor say aye. 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 Ban private back rooms. Um, Motion passes. Back at you, Madam Clerk. Require brighter lighting and more video surveillance. All those in favor say aye. And require background checks on all employees at the clubs, not just the dancers. All those in favor say aye. 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 With that, the council has just imposed a bunch of new restrictions on the strip clubs. Now, it's time for the council to decide whether to kick the clubs out of downtown. This is the moment that will decide whether Velma and John will have to leave their homes, whether Stephanie will lose her job, whether Cammie will have to leave the corner he's been on for decades, whether new Reno will leave room for old Reno as the city continues to change. Mayor Hillary Sheevy makes it clear where she stands on the issue. Okay. So one of the things um, I would say about location, and I have not wavered on this. My position has been very, very clear. Um, I want them in places where they don't become out of sight, out of mind. I want them in places where they're well lit. I want them in places where they're very well regulated. The mayor wants those bright, gaudy strip clubs smack in the middle of downtown, where it's easier to keep an eye on them. And I'm not hearing a lot of dissent from the rest of the council. The mayor calls for a final vote on whether to let the strip clubs stay downtown. All right, thank you. Okay, so I have a motion from um, 
from Cal or, uh, Vice Mayor Dewar, and I have a second from uh, Councilwoman Weber. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed. I'm opposed. Um, motion carries. And with that, Cammy gets to keep his clubs right where they are. Jenny Breckis is the only nay vote. The wild orchid is in her ward, and she still doesn't think it's a good fit for the neighborhood. This about face by the council, this seemingly sharp pivot away from its crackdown, might be stunning if it weren't so, well, ordinary. This kind of thing happens all the time in local government. There's a groundswell of energy to enact some grand sweeping change. Then the bureaucracy of actually creating that change collapses under its own weight or even its own ineptitude. Here, it's been four years since the strip club moratorium was first floated in council. Since then, two lawmakers have been replaced. A key staff member who worked on this project has actually died. The air has gone out of this balloon. So, the wild orchid isn't going anywhere. It will remain a bulwark against gentrification, a monolith against sushi burrito joints, a glittering beacon of vice that built Reno in the first place. Or it won't. Maybe one day Cammy will succumb to developers dangling big checks in front of his eyes and give up his corner to new Reno. This is a living, breathing city undergoing a period of tremendous change. And change doesn't necessarily discriminate. Maybe Cammy will get bought out. Or maybe the grand Tesla experiment in the desert will go bust. Regardless, people living in the Ponderosa Hotel, people like the Tesla workers making a go of it in the new factory, the women earning a living in the strip clubs, they'll have to continue navigating Reno's reinvention. The council vote didn't change that. After the break, Anjanette checks in on Cami and Velma and Stephanie to see how they're faring in the new Reno. Okay, let's go back to Anjanette. A week after the city council vote, I head back to the Wild Orchid. It's a Thursday night around 9 p.m., so it's not real busy yet. The manager, Jeremy Cronick, meets me at the door as usual. This time, he's carrying a microphone, too. Turns out he's doubling as the DJ tonight. He's in his typical jokey mood, making good use of that microphone to introduce me as the next dancer on stage. Round one with Anjanette. Just kidding. <laughs> Round one with Hennessy. <laughs> That's the photographer from my newspaper you hear laughing in the background. At least he got a kick out of Jeremy's joke. But one of the strippers didn't. She demanded to know who this new girl, Anjanette, was. I'm like, no, hi, it's me. I'm a journalist. Cammy's sitting at his back corner table. I find him in his normal mood. At least the one we've gotten to know over the past year. Aggrieved. Despite his apparent win at council, he's still steaming. He can't get over the new restrictions, the ban on private rooms, the extra lighting, the video surveillance. Also, now that he's back on his own turf, his bravado has returned. It's like you're, you're the bad kid in the class and you didn't do anything wrong, but you're going to sit there with a dunce hat on while all the other students get this, you know, and you, uh, what did you do wrong? And Cammie I, I sees like this as the new normal. City inspectors and police officers constantly crawling through the club. This is not old Reno anymore, the one that left him alone all these years. None of these people have, have spent five minutes in a strip club, and they're making the rules about a business they haven't even spent five minutes in. How is that going to work? Just so Joe Henry can have all the rules he can. This is Joe Henry. We had a meeting. Joe Henry is the head of Reno Code Enforcement. He's a guy Cammy will be seeing a lot under this new regime. Cammy sees him as the next bully he has to fight. He sat there for two hours and I fucked me for two hours. For two hours, I'm sitting here going, this is a guy who works with the city and he's looking at me like he wants to beat the shit out of me for two hours. You tell me how professional that is. I've heard a lot of Cammy rants over the last year. This one puts them all to shame. Like, what is this guy's, what is, I'm like, did I screw his girlfriend? I mean, I, who, who is this guy? 
And they're like, oh, this is the guy that's running enforcement. I'm like, what? That's that's great. Cammy gets to keep his clubs Anyways. in their profitable locations downtown, but he's not willing to give up the fight. He's planning to go to court to fight to keep his back rooms, and he's already gunning for the next election. He wants to target Councilwoman Jenny Breckis, the lone vote against him, and take another shot at Carl Hall. I don't care if I how much money I got to spend. I'm not going to be barbecued in city council anymore. And Jenny and Carl Hall are two public enemy number ones for us. That's how I look at it. We came close with Carl. Hopefully with Jenny we have a better... I mean, all we can do is try, right? We'll see, we'll see how it runs. And this is how we leave Cammy, still a petulant king of his fiefdom, still refusing to change even as the city changes around him still trying to hold on to his power as Reno's reverence of vice continues to slip. The titans of old Reno and those of new Reno pay little mind to the people who must find their way in the changing landscape. People like Velma Scholes and her neighbor John living in the Ponderosa Hotel. With the wild orchid stain put, John and Velma are out of immediate danger. Cammie is no longer threatening to double their rent, but that doesn't mean they're in the clear for good. New Reno wasn't really designed with them in mind, and life isn't easy for them now. I got a taste of that the day I took a trip with them to get groceries at one of the local food pantries. I'm waiting for Velma at the bus stop about a block away from the Ponderosa. The day is sweltering. I catch sight of her walking toward me, pulling a handcart behind her that's almost as tall as she is. These carts is our lifeline. These granny carts, I sure couldn't carry nothing home. I'm too little. She relies on this granny cart. It not only carries her groceries, it's a crutch. She has a bum hip that can give out without warning. Her cart has caught her more than once. Velma has come prepared for the heat. She carries a little spray bottle full of water with a couple drops of alcohol and lavender oil to help keep her cool. She sprays down her legs a couple times while we wait for the bus. Did you want to stand in the shade at all? Oh, I'm okay. Yeah. Honey, I'm used to the sun, huh? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes you don't have a choice, but when you have a choice, it feels good. John joins us at the bus stop for the journey to the food pantry. He tells me to prepare myself for a long afternoon. Heading to the food pantry isn't like dropping by the grocery store. It's a process. Oh, it's three hours. Sure. We don't get home till 2.30. It's only a quarter after 11 right now. First, there's the bus ride. It takes us about two miles south, dropping us in front of one of Reno's more lavish hotel casinos. One night here could run you almost as much as Velma spends on rent in a month. After the bus, you gotta walk about a quarter mile to the pantry, past a liquor store, a place that sells CBD oil, some dilapidated apartments, and a laundromat. Thelma pulls her cart behind her the whole way. We arrive at an older office building. This is not really where I'm expecting to find a food pantry. It looks like a place an accountant or a dentist might have an office. It'll be another hour before the food pantry opens. No. Yeah, I'm gonna go into that thing. I'm gonna go sit on that. Thing. Okay. Oh, it is shadier over there, huh? We go right down there, it's shadier. It's almost 100 degrees out. So hot, the soles of my shoes are starting to melt on the black asphalt. But this isn't a trip Velma can skip. This food pantry isn't open very often. It's a fair amount of work, but it's even worse when you ain't got nothing to eat. That's where it's a fair amount. Even though you have a place to leave, you still got to eat. As we wait, Velma tells me stories of growing up in Oklahoma, picking cotton, waitressing, working in nursing homes. The line for the food bank continues to grow until there are dozens of people in line. Elderly people, young couples, moms with their children in tow, people who sometimes seem almost invisible to those making decisions about the city. There's quite a few, honey. You'd be shocked at the hungry folks in town. Hungry people, yeah. I've seen them when they start there and they go all the way down, line back up here, it makes a circle. The pantry opens up and Velma snakes her way through the various rooms. First, toiletries. Toothpaste? 
toothpaste. I'll take a tube yeah. of toothpaste. Thank you, dear. Then canned goods. <laughs> Two of these here. Two of those. Okay. Yeah. And little sausages. Then food for her two little dogs. Gotta feed my puppy. She got duck meatballs. That's great. Thank you, honey. Y'all have a blessed day. By the time Velma has made her way through the pantry, her cart is overflowing. She and John gather to redistribute food into each other's carts and backpacks, balancing the weight for the trek back to the bus stop. The walk seems much longer when you're pushing a rattling metal cart heavy with food. This entire trip has taken more than three hours. It's a blessing, she says, when the bus pulls up to take us home. Get in this nice cool air, we love to go to bed. Yeah. Huh. Velma out. turns 65 in a few months and will be eligible for senior housing, assistance that would put her in an actual apartment surrounded by other people her age. But she's not sure she'll apply. The waiting list is daunting. From Velma's point of view, she already has a home with a bed in it. She has two feet and a cart to get her to the food pantries. She's got her family and her friend John. Others have it much worse, she reasons. You know, you could be in, in a wheelchair and not able to get around and having to put up with the bus driver not wanting you to get your big old wheelchair on the bus. I said, some of us are still lucky enough to be walking. As the city changes around her, she won't stop to rest. Even if it hurts, you still walk until you can't walk no more. Stephanie's mantra could just as well be, you still dance until you can't dance no more. She's still working in the clubs while she's trying to get her conviction overturned. But she's starting to contemplate a life without stripping. She's even enrolled in the junior college in her hometown. I'm back at the Spice House hanging out with her as she goes through her routine, getting ready for work. Makeup, outfit, perfume. I always uh, spray myself hella because like, I get a lot of compliments on um, how like I smell good and then it makes me like more tips and they want more dances from me. So I always constantly am spraying myself. What kind of perfume is that? Um, this one is Victoria's Secret Bombshell Nights. She heads over to her locker and pulls out a pink and blue bottle of booze. And I don't really drink that much, just like a couple of shots. I had this bottle in here for like, how long? Is it vodka? Yeah. Before this, I hardly ever drink, but it just makes it easier to deal so I'm not like boring. But if I take like a shot, like I'll be more like what they want. Yeah. Like. Vodka with a Gatorade chaser. <laughs> <laughs> then it's time to hit the floor. So, um. I think we're ready to go downstairs. I'm gonna, um... She immediately recognizes an older guy sitting at the bar, goes and gives him a hug. He looks happy to see Stephanie, but not me and my microphone. She pulls me aside and leads me into the women's restroom. Oh, you can stand here real quick and I'll talk to you. Um, that guy, that guy, like, he gave me a hug. He has, like, a lot of money. So, um... Stephanie has been incredibly gracious, letting me follow her around with a microphone during many intimate moments. I'm not trying to like be rude or anything, but how much um, longer did you want to stay? It's a not so subtle hint that it's time for me to go. She gives me a quick hug, leaving a trace of glitter and perfume on my shoulder, and walks away from me, balanced on her seven inch platform heels, squeezed into her slinky hot pink spandex dress clutching the purse where she'll hold her tips. She walks toward the man sitting at the bar who wants her company. As with any city trying to reinvent itself, this story is far from over in Reno. But that's a story for another time. Right now, 
It's time for Stephanie to dance. The City is a production of USA Today and is distributed in partnership with Wondery. Our show this season was reported and produced by Anjanette Damon, Phil Corbett, Camille Stanley, Taylor Macon, and me, Robin Amer. Our editors are Amy Pyle and Matt Doig. Ben Austin is our story consultant. Original music and mixing is by Hannes Brown. Performance on our theme music this season by Hannes and Indofunk Satish. Legal review by Tom Curley. Launch oversight by Shannon Green. Additional production by Emily Liu, Sam Greenspan, Wilson Sayer, and Jenny Casas. Video production this season by Hannah Gaber, Andy Barron, Ben Spillman, Sam Gross, with editing oversight by Dave Hamlin and Chris Powers. Graphics by Janet Lurkey, Veronica Bravo, and Sean Sullivan. Brian Dugan is the Reno Gazette Journal's executive editor. Chris Davis is our VP for investigations. Scott Stein is our VP of product. Nicole Carroll is our editor-in-chief. And our president and publisher is Maribel Wadsworth. Special thanks this season to Emily Nash, Julie Mackinnon, Silas Lyons, Tim Lurkey, Annette Mead, Stan Wilson, Lorelai Cretu, Mary Nahorniak, Holly Moore, Elizabeth Shell, Emily Brown, Alex Patachik, Sarab Aljajakli, Liz Carboni, and Stephanie Chung. I'm Robin Amer. You can find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at The City Pod, or visit our website, that's thecitypodcast.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, check out these other videos from USA Today to stay up to date with all the latest news.